Connection is key for the Death, Dying, Diagnosis and Doulas podcast. If we speak to you and people that work in your space, reach out for a collaboration. Julie at doulaconnections.com.au Hi, Tracy. How are you? Really looking forward to talking to you today. I reckon you're going to have a a lot to offer uh, people in terms of talking about aged care and also in a difficult conversation. So first up, uh, can you tell people a little bit about uh, you and your business and maybe a bit about your background? So hi, and thanks for having me on, Julie. I'm Tracy and I'm in Tassie, Southern Tassie. Um, I have been an end of life doula for just on a year. Um, my background is I'm an enrolled nurse and I've nursed in lots of different settings over the last 20 years. Nursing has been what brought me to, to doulaing. Um, I have my own business and my business name is EOL Bucket List, which stands for End of Life Bucket List. Uh, I chose that just to be a little bit more upbeat because, as we know, the whole death conversation still seems there's still a bit of taboo out in the community, so to brighten things up a little bit. Um, So my focus is on end-of-life planning and supporting people with in their times of need around end of life discussions, end of life support, that type uh-huh. of thing. Wonderful. Yep. I actually love your name. And I, I was just having a conversation with somebody a few minutes ago about how I feel sometimes I have to, uh, I don't know, temper my language because I sometimes think of some funny things that I want to say and I'm just aware that it's such a, a sacred space and, and sometimes a very deeply you know, it can be, there's so much grief for people and so much fear. And yet sometimes there's just, I see these, I see the humorous side of it or the, you know, like the, I love the, the bucket list side of it and just things that people want to do and talk about. And, uh, and I'd love to bring a little bit more lightness to that conversation. So if that's where you want to go, that would be lovely. So I know that you're, um, that you've got a real, a depth of experience in navigating the aged care system. So can you, I th- and again, I think it's a, a, it's a big issue that a lot of people have a lot of concerns about. So talk about why you think navigating that aged care system is so important and what people can do to try to make that less stressful. Yeah, so, okay, so the aged care system, so now we have this big portal throughout Australia that's called My Age Care. Um, and that system is to, well, it was designed to, to bring all the services and all the supports pretty much like under the one umbrella. Um, and what it's for is to support um, elderly people in our community, help to support them to become, to remain as independent as possible and remain in their own homes. So, um, there's a lot of different, well, quite a few different types of funding under the My Age Care umbrella, but they're all targeted to keeping people as best that they can be, helping them to, to reach their goals, as in, you know, remaining independent primarily, you know, staying in good health mm. and so forth. But the system still comes with a lot of confusion. Uh, there's different types of assessments people need to go through and, and people often don't understand how to, you know, how to access something that seems inaccessible, especially for a lot of our elderly people that don't understand, that don't have computers, that don't, um, you know, that don't understand technology and so forth because most of the referral process things still go through, you know, still go through the internet. Um, but... So the system, it's it's a good system in theory because it, it has a, there's a program or a funding type to suit all different sorts of, um, all, well, all different situations, I guess. So there's reablement programs for people that may have had a fall um, and they've lost mobility following the fall or after an operation, you know, like they might have had a hip replacement. And then as we know, it takes a bit of time to, get back to being independent and people generally especially as they get older need more specialized help to to reach those goals to get back to their independence 
and as they get older, um, they may and you know often we don't have or we might have lots of family supports, but with our busy lives, our you know our families generally. I know my kids are all working mostly, or working, and they don't have the time that they might like to have to spend to give us a hand with the shopping or help us do up our shoelaces after you know if our mobility is not good and that type of thing so these funding um, sources are able to provide services to help us stay at home yeah um, yeah so is that so when you think about like oh that is just sounds fabulous to me like keep people at home as long as possible in you know in their environment where they feel comfortable and, and it's familiar is so is that is there a lot of um, organisation that needs to go into that to get services at home or is it harder to get into an aged care uh, facility? No, it's so it all starts with a with an assessment so with an assessment on a community level. Um, back in the day and, and most people will know that you, there's someone you can call in the community who knows who it is, the community nurse, the GP can arrange to, to get a couple of hours of um, social support or someone to come and do the hoovering, you know, do the do the vacuuming and changing the bed linen, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So services can start off at that level, so the more basic level, and then they work their way up. But yeah, there's a process of different types of assessments. They've got to have an aged care assessment team, an ACAT assessment, and then they've got to go on wait list to wait for whatever type of, you know, the bigger funding pools of what they've been approved for. Um, there's some types of funding that they can get limited services pretty much straight away and going into aged care is, a, is another, you know, it's another bucket of worms altogether. Yes. So the <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I, I absolute buck of work. And honestly, I'm an RN and honestly that I have trouble. I don't know how many times that I've filled in forms. Again, this is family, but filled in forms and then it wasn't right and it wasn't right and it wasn't right. And honestly, it was I found it so complicated. I thought, how do, how does the average person do this without yeah. the knowledge that I've got? So yeah. what, and quite often they don't. Uh, quite often people shake their hands a bit, they rub their hands together and they just go, it's too hard because, um, you know, they're probed for so much information, not only about their health and their physical, their family, their finances, which a lot of elderly have, you know, struggled to have to tell a stranger about their finances and that type of thing. But most of the funding types are, are means tested. So that's just, you know, it's a part of it. So helping people navigate that. And there are navigation um, platforms out there to help. And even under the My Age Care umbrella, there's, you know, there's navigators to help people. And, and it is getting better. And I'm only saying that because I've had four years experience working directly with that. Um, it took me probably the first year to understand, you know, how any of the assessment worked really. Um, but on a, on a more personal level, it's still miles away from being simple at all. There's nobody to, or there's providers in the community that um, when you've been allocated a, a larger funding pool, like a home care package or an NDIS package for disability support, um, there's a lot of providers in the community then once you've been uh, approved for those types of fundings that will, um, be banging down your door wanting to come in and talk to you about it because you know they want to help you navigate so help you coordinate your funding when it comes through so but they're not really helping you well they can't help you because it's not their role yet yeah. to, to actually help you get that in the first place so there's yeah there's a lot of navigation issues um social workers and people in the community are there to help people but still it's about how do you access it yeah mm. no, i totally agree and yeah. and even again, personal experience i mean i never even had a, a centrelink number and i yeah. because i'm trying to put documents in on behalf of other people who i'm their guardian then i it was just the things that i personally had to provide for yeah. uh, myself so that i could then give information on behalf of other people even that was a massive process. It's yeah, I, I hear you because it's funny you say that because the day before yesterday, 
I was actually with a client in a client's home. Um, she's been approved by ACAP for a home care package. And so she's got some um, Commonwealth home support approvals in the meantime. So that bit of shopping assistance and the bit of domestic. Um, and she'd been given her numbers and bits and pieces, but she's not on Centrelink either. And so for me to be able, because she didn't understand any of it, mm. so, and she, you know, asked people to leave and things because it just got so overwhelming for her. So she called me in to help her navigate just the beginning. So she ended up having a successful ACAP assessment and got all these approvals, but then was bombarded by lots of different providers um, of the Commonwealth Home Support to pretty much win her business for the domestic and the social support mm. shopping. Um, but, yeah, she didn't have a Centrelink number. So I actually had to call my aged care to, to go on as a, you know, a representative to be able to speak to the providers on her behalf, which is what she wanted. So I had to create a whole account for me to have mm. a my aged care. Uh, it's, yeah. That's it. Yeah. And, and so I have a my aged care number too, so that I can now help other people. It's just, honestly, I, I just find it really uh, complex and a lot of friction. And I suppose, you know, if I look at my mum, 85, if she didn't have me there to help her with things, I just can't, I just think it would be so overwhelming. I mean, the computer skills aren't there. There's this assumption that there's somebody to do it and there's not always. No, no, no. There's, there's not. And quite often our our parents and so forth, they don't necessarily want to be talking to us about their finances and no. about whether they're having trouble with continence and, you know, is it, mm. there's there's pride and lot, you know, lots of things come into play. So it, it is complex and it's quite, in, it's quite intrusive. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And there's a lot of people out there without you know, without any connections in the community, without, mm. you know, without that support. Yeah. So what's your role in this? So if, if because I know you're an end-of-life doula, so if you have a client contact you and said, look, I've now got an aged care package awarded to me or given to me, but I don't know what to do, then what would you do? How, how would you manage that? Right, well, I would go and see the client and, and talk to them, probably have a look at their assessment if they've got a copy of it, the, the ACAT assessment, um, and uh, just to ask the client some basic questions about what, what their needs were. So what is it that they want? What did they want to get out of it? So what did they want from their, their package? And then what their role is then is to for them to choose a provider to be able to support them. So, you know, then if they wanted to, then I would be helping them choose a, an aged care provider, someone that's going to be able to give them what it is that they're looking for. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. what about if somebody needs to go into residential aged care? Like that to me is another whole can of ugh, yeah. confusion. <laughs> so if, if you were working with a family or a client that, um, that felt that needed to go into aged care, what, what do they need to have available? Like what... How do you make all of that happen? I mean, I think about the the different costs in aged care. Like they all seem to be different and different aged care facilities yeah. and some are state and some are private. And like, what's what's your take on some of that? Yeah, so, yeah, so it's another bucket on its own. But, yeah, it is. It's really complex. And there's a lot of things that that individual or that family need to have organised. So first off, they need to have had that ACAT assessment and have the approvals for residential care, which isn't, which isn't difficult to get that in itself once you actually have an assessment. Here in Tassie, the wait for an assessment isn't too bad. It's generally only a few weeks. If it's urgent, there's, you know, there's ways, if the people understand how to you know, find these links, obviously, there's, there's ways to make assessments happen if it, there's an emergency and the person needs to go into care, you know, as an urgent thing. But as a run of the mill, you need to wait for an assessment to be approved. Um, then you need to start thinking about um, the documentation to do, you know, to go into residential care. So you've got to provide, you know, all your bank details, all your um, financial details, um, health and, well, pretty much everything. And then you've got to start looking at facilities. 
So what sort of, what do you want from your facility? You know, what sort of services, what sort of, you know, support? Do you want individual living? Do you want to be able to go from an individual living unit into the nursing home, which is called ageing in place? No, so what do you want out of it? Or if it's someone with dementia, it, do, you know, do they really need to go into a more, you know, if they're quite high functioning, a, a dementia specific facility? And then help them navigate what, what's going to work best for them, ideally, and then go out there and start talking to providers. So you need to approach the providers of um, residential care and, and ask to go and have a look around, see what it is they offer. Um, you are able to look at this um, sort of thing on websites, but it, it often doesn't make a lot of sense to an elderly person. Um, if there's families, a family will quite often, you know, help take them around and to view some different beds. They call them, you know, we go and look at that bed. So you'll go and you um, look at a room because you either accept or don't accept a room. And as far as funding goes, it really can, it really depends on what sort of money you've got. So if you're uh, a member of a couple and the other, so the husband and wife living together um, and the husband's going into care, but the wife's staying in the home, she doesn't have to sell the home. Uh, that's something that's sort of, you know, come out of the, you know, the last few years, there was a lot, there's, there was a lot of fear around this having to sell your home thing. Uh, it still can be the case if you are the only one living in your home, but mm. if you're part of a couple, it's different. It's assessed differently. And can that be you... like a de facto or say you had a, a daughter and a mum that were living together and had done for years? Like what, what happens then? Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to advise on that because it would come down to the individual circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that would be probably one to talk to um, Centrelink about because through Medicare and Centrelink, you know, through the Commonwealth services, that's where the assessment about the money comes from. So you have to do an, an income assessment when you apply to go into care oh, and for a home care package. Um, mm. You know, they, they need to know what assets and money you've got and sort of where it is, how disposable things are. Um, and if you've got a you know, if you've got investments, a pool of money, or you are the only one in the home, then generally um, you're going to be asked to put so much towards your room. Um, and some of that is generally uh, refundable uh, when you don't need that room anymore. Uh, right. But in saying that, there are um, subsidised places available as well, uh, which means that you can apply for a subsidised place. Most nursing homes, well, well, maybe not most, a lot of nursing homes have subsidised places. So the government um, subsidises the bed. So they'll pay, I think it's 85% of their pension will go towards their care. So towards yep. their room. Yeah. Yeah. So that's for people that don't have a home to sell or don't have, you know, ass assets to, to put that money in. Yeah. Mm. Okay. It's, it's an individual thing. Yeah, no, fair, fair enough. So, and I mean, the other thing that I found interesting was that you're dealing with different government departments. <laughs> I was, a, I got a bit shocked to find that I'd provided documents to say Centrelink, but my aged care didn't know that. Or, and I remember mm -hmm. saying to somebody, but I sent that in. Well, where did you send it? Well, I sent it to my aged care. Well, but this is Centrelink. We don't have that. And I was like, oh, I, I was just shocked that it was, still the Commonwealth Government, if you like, but they, but the departments didn't seem to talk to each other. Have you had, is that yeah. correct? Or do you think I sort of misunderstood that? No, I, yeah, you would think, you would have thought that since the My Age Care umbrella has all these departments under them, and now you've got a My Age Care account, you'll know that, you know, Centrelink and, and Medicare and all the different things are, are linked there, but no, they're all separate. You've got to provide mm. the same information to whichever one of them's asking for it, which is, yeah, it, it's a challenge. Mm. It's, a, it's a challenge. 
And yeah. I and honestly, I I just think our elderly people. This is just my 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 opinion. I I don't think they deserve it to be difficult. It it whatever they're doing at the moment. I know that the government's doing stuff with the best of intent, but it's not streamlined. Um, and I just think they could do a better job of it. But that's that's another conversation. But uh, but I don't want to you know I don't want to get too political here now, and I don't expect you to. But I think I do honestly think it can be streamlined and much improve from where it is. Um, so now I'd love to talk to you about, I know that you also specialise in, in conversation. So having, you know, the deep and meaningful, the challenging conversations um, and helping people with that. So why do you think conversations about ageing and death are so, I don't know, for some people sort of, you know, we're no go zone. So why do you think that is? Oh. It's got to be fear. Fear, I would say. Yeah. It's, there's this sort of this unspoken perception in the community that if you talk about death, it's going to make it happen faster, which is, of course is silly. Mm. But I guess without people delving into the conversation, they're not really, you know, they're not really giving themselves an opportunity to look at look at anything to do with death because they just don't want to know about it. Oh, I'm not ready. Oh, I've got a long time before I need to do any of that. So you, it's just, it, you just get that defensive straight away. Mm. So I, yeah, so I find, um, en- you know, entering a conversation. Well, for an example, when people, I've got new neighbours, met them on the weekend. What do you do? Oh, I'm an end of life doula. Oh, <laughs> oh, sorry. I can't find anything on your calendar for them. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you got Siri talking to you in the background there. <laughs> Siri doesn't know what a dollar is either. Doesn't <laughs> but yeah, but you instantly you instantly get that oh death anything to do with death um, and straight away you've got heckles generally although yeah. yeah although there are segments of the community and and I I think people are starting to well different parts of the population are certainly starting to be a bit more open to exploring the conversation and I think um, things like you know palliative care week and advanced care directive days you know planning days that we've got through the year that are highly publicized and things now I think that's starting to help chip away at some of that taboo but, yeah, as a whole, it's still difficult to, to get into that conversation with anybody that's not already open to it. Yep. So, so, what, so what would your tips be? So, you know, and it doesn't matter whether it's the old or sick person wanting to talk about death or it's the family that thinks, you know, we need to talk about this. What are your best tips to try to, to get that open and honest conversation happening so that people actually really genuinely talk and listen to each other? What are your tips? Well, I think, well, my approach generally depends on a couple of things, but it depends on who you're talking to and what their demeanour is at that moment. So whether they're being defensive or or whether they're open. But generally, if you're being invited into a conversation, people are ready to explore, you know, because you've come there to to have a conversation about whatever it is they want to speak about. Yeah. Um, but talking to somebody on the street can be, you know, can be a little bit a little bit different. And and so to try and smooth off that confrontingness of of entering the conversation, I generally go in um, talking about well approaching it on the on the way well not the way on the um with the attitude that what we're going to talk about. So if we're talking about, you know, have you got your affairs in order? Have, have you thought about your bucket list? What are the things you want to achieve before, you know, before you expire, before you die? Um, have you got your paperwork in order? Do you have a will? Have you done an advanced care directive? Um, opening a conversation and people say, well, what, I don't need an advanced care directive. Well, what is that? My, my wife knows what you know what I want um it's and so then trying to break it down and soften it by well if we've you know if we've had conversations with our with our people and what sort of things you know have you explored 
um, talking about, especially with advanced care directives, with if you are unable to um, make a decision about your care because you're incapacitated, because you've hit your head and you're unconscious or you've had an accident or a stroke um, and you're in intensive care and there are uh, decisions that may need to be made. Um, if you haven't ha if you haven't had a, a really good um, thorough conversation, there can be, you know, well, people are faced, your loved ones are faced with making decisions on your behalf, which is, you know, an excruciatingly yeah. traumatic thing for anyone to have to go through, even if they know what your wishes are. Whereas if you've delved into it um, enough and had those conversations and talked about what, you know, what the quality, your quality of life, you know, what's important to you with your quality of life and, and things like that, and you've written it down, then you're taking that burden away from your loved ones yeah. because you've, you know, you've got it written down. So depending on the individual, yeah, a, approaching it like really you're, you're doing something good for your people. By yep. being, you know, by having these conversations and and knowing what the answers to the to the questions are really, um, and, and having the conversations with your family and and hopefully writing it down, then you're, uh, yeah, opening the conversation up and also you're letting people know what you yeah what your wishes are in in terms of all sorts of things. So not just if you're incapacitated, but. Um, until recently, I mean, I didn't know that my mum didn't want a funeral. Mm. Um, so even that, we have people die suddenly, and we don't know we don't know whether they wanted to be buried or cremated, what what their beliefs are or what their values are, and we do in general life, but not when it comes down to things around end of life because they're not generally a table discussion. Well, they are at my house probably your house, but not a lot of people's houses. So I think, yeah, just opening up those conversations because a lot of people still to seem to um, just take on that, that, oh, I've, d I've done my will. Everything's written in my will. My solicitor's got a copy of my will without thinking about, well, maybe your will's not going to be read until way after the fact. Um, and then... Yeah, and especially when it gets down to the, the more personal things like, you know, it depends what sort of conversation you're entering, of course. But if you're entering a conversation with someone with a life-limiting illness um, or an elderly person that's starting to think about their end of life and, and oh, what am I going to do with my things? And, and they, they want to get themselves a little bit organised to know that, that their people are looked after or to know that their cat's looked after or their possessions are allocated or whatever it is that's important to them mm. without having those you know deep and meaningful conversations yeah uh, having yep. some sort of plan it's, it's anyone's guess true yeah. so what, what's your very best tip so again i'm just thinking so say i'm 88 you know and i'm sitting at home and I want to, I really think, you know, I want to get things ready and I want to tell people what I want. And you might have tried a few times to talk to your children or your grandchildren or your friend or whoever, and everybody shuts you down. All right. So what would be your best tip to actually get people to really hear you and, and understand that this is an important conversation that you want to have? Well, Broaching it like that, I actually had a client a few months ago in the hospital who something happened and then suddenly she only had a very short time to live. And one of her siblings was in the room, I was in the room obviously, and she want, was trying to tell him what was in her will and what her wishes were. And, and he was beautiful, but he kept shutting her down mm. because he didn't want to talk about it, he, you know, didn't because we needed to be positive and, and all of, you know, that's that's the trajectory he was on was mm. he didn't want to talk about death because we can't give up hope and, and all of that type of thing. And so in it, she, she just, you know, she just said it's really, really important that you know, that, that you know what it, what it is that I want. The way I've written my will, I need you to know what I, like what I mean by that it turned out that something wasn't worded very well and she wanted to explain that 
but mm. she didn't get didn't get the opportunity. So I think for me and with my experience with that just that that bit, my experience has been for the person who's trying to get the message across to really make it about them mm. and not about the person that they're trying to talk to. Because if you if if I'm you know, if I'm close to death and I want to get a message to my daughter and she's too upset and doesn't want to, doesn't want to deal with the fact that she's, you know, that mum's about to die, she doesn't want to listen to any of that. But if I, if I plead with her of how important it is for, to me for her to know what the message that I'm trying to get across to her, I find that just changes the dynamic of of the mood and the conversation completely. Yeah. Then you'll get you'll get that active listening. Then even with the people that are, are defensive against it. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. So something along the line of, I know that this is uncomfortable for you to talk about, but I need you to really listen to me because this is important to me. Something like that. You know. Yeah. Is that- ab- absolutely. And, and that's why it's so important for us to have these conversations before you know, if at all possible, to have these conversations now at any any time of our life. Yeah. So that it's something that's it's not a secret about, you know, what, what we want and, and what our wishes if this happens to us or or when death approaches at the this time in my life, this is what I, you know, this is what I would want. I want mm-hmm. to die at home if I've got the option. Um I'd like my family surrounded by my family if that's if that's okay with them. Yeah. And that type of thing, rather than mm. being put on that, put on the spot in the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I love that, Tracy. So, can you tell me why you called your business uh, "End of Life Bucket List"? So, did you do that because, like, you know that there's a lot of the important things that like you've mentioned, like wills and power of attorney and all that, or did you do it because? you were trying to empower people to say, what's important to me? What do I want to get done? Like what, why that name yeah. and what was the intention? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, that's exactly why. And how it came, how it came about me becoming a doula in the first place, Julie, and I'll just share this with you just quietly. <laughs> um, and everyone I was, else. <laughs> was, I was actually diagnosed um, with a chronic illness. Um, and it could be a life-limiting illness, but with technology, with medicine and everything, you know, I'm okay. It's all, all okay. But it really made me reevaluate things and made me look at things. And I, I reflected on my life and thought, oh, my God, there's all these things, literally, that I should have a bucket list, all these mm. things I want to do, all these things that I was going to do, that I wanted to do things in my life that could be better and so I I guess I kind of set to work with how how am I you know what am I doing we only get one shot at this and in my work I was seeing elderly people because I was working with elderly people in the community as a a coordinator of government funding helping people to stay at home Um, and it was like oh my god there's all these all these people there they're getting shipped off to hospital and shipped off to hospice when they want to stay at home. And, and it was, and a lot of it was because people haven't really delved into what is my purpose? What, what am I doing? What is important to me? If I've only got a bit of time left, what, what do I want to do? What messages do I want to leave behind for my children? And what do I want to happen with my property? So there were a lot of things that just, sort of bombarded my brain and, mm. and I just had to I just felt like I just had to get to work to to fix things to make things better because I, I wasn't living my best life and a lot of people that I was working with weren't living their best lives and I figured if if I could just be one little tiny little part of of the solution to help um, people collaborate and help people bring people together get things done that are important to them and as we know everybody's different and everybody has different values and different things so when i was thinking about the name for my business bucket list just kept coming to me because that's that's what i was doing is i was doing my own bucket list i can get 
I, you know, I, I can work for myself, work from home, I suffer with fatigue. So working from home and having my own schedule works a lot better for me. Um, being able to, I guess, fulfill some of my bucket list around, around my pro property. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly as far as my work and my passion and I guess my, my purpose is to, to be able to connect with people on, on a bigger level, on a deeper level. Uh, my, my clients are really, I'm really connected to my clients. And in, as you know, as an RN, in most fields of healthcare, and doula isn't healthcare, it's social, as you know, most healthcare is, we're always told to not get too connected. Don't be too, you know, don't let people get attached. It's dangerous because of all these different reasons. And fair enough too, because it's true, you, you, you know, because you don't have the time and you can't necessarily be in everybody's life forever. But in this role, it's different. And I mm. can be in there forever or my forever, whichever, you know, whichever comes first. So being able to follow through, being able to follow through, being able to actually be able to be there and be able to be by someone's side or hold somebody's hand, help them communicate with their family be there at their last moment you know it's, it's beautiful it, it it really truly is um mm -hmm. you know I've, I've meeting helen becoming an end of life doula it's i couldn't have done anything better for myself and my family um in the last year being out on my own my whole life's changed and for the better and if you talk to my clients uh they'll tell you that it's for their for their better you know for their wellness as well that's beautiful that's beautiful all right so tracy you know i know you're in tassie so uh if people wanted to contact you um specifically in your area because they wanted to work with you how what area do you work in and how do they connect with you well i work pretty much in southern tasmania um mm -hmm. because there's north and south obviously um mm -hmm. and still does cover quite a big area um, but I work all over Southern. Um, I have a website and I have a Facebook page uh, and my deep, you know, my details are out there, but I'm happy to share my website details with anybody. I'm always happy for someone to give me a call or flick me an email and make a time to have a chat in person or over Zoom if that's what they prefer or, you know, distance or right. anything. Yep. So what's your website? So www eol bucketlist.com so eol end of life bucket list beautiful and wonderful yeah. all right well thanks trace that was a, a great conversation and i really appreciate your time today thank you thank you julie <laughs>